Greetings and welcome to Site Life's webinar on global eye health and primary health care. We have people joining us from around the world. So whether it's early in the morning and you're just settling in with your first cup of coffee or third, like I am, um, or you're winding down for the day, I want to thank everyone for joining us for this important and timely conversation. Before we get started, a few housekeeping notes. We encourage attendee questions and kindly ask that you submit them using Zoom's Q&A function. After our formal program, the SiteLife team will pull the questions from the chat and the panelists and I will work to get through as many of them as possible before our webinar concludes. You can use the chat function for general comments during the presentations. We have a lot to cover. So first, let me ground our conversation in why we're gathered here today and to what we hope to achieve. As regards to the former, it starts with the trajectory for blindness published in the Lancet Global Health Journal, which estimated that globally blindness will triple by 2050, not the direction we want to be headed. And this year, the World Health Assembly's May 2021 adoption of two ambitious eye health targets for countries to achieve by 2030. Although these targets focus on refractive error and cataracts, rather than corneal care or the elimination of corneal blindness, which SightLife is specifically working to achieve, we welcome the targets because they underscore, for the first time ever, the world's unmet needs in eye health as a primary healthcare priority, and moreover, one that is key to achieving the sustainable development goals. This is because eye health helps people stay in school, pursue a livelihood, and provide for those they love. It enables human connections and experiences that help communities thrive. Today, in conversation with our esteemed panelists, our goals are threefold. First, we'll be exploring the role of primary health care in strengthening health systems and patient health outcomes. Next, we'll contextualize and assess lessons learned from primary health care policies and programs in low and middle income countries by discussing challenges and opportunities in integrating eye care and identifying pathways for supporting eye health impact at scale. We are pleased to have a brilliant group of leading experts who are also quite fun, I might add, in global health and primary health care with us today to cover these learning objectives. Joining us, we have Dr. Sangeeta Abrol, ophthalmologist at Safterjung Hospital, Delhi, and professor of ophthalmology at Vardman Madhvir Medical College. Dr. Matthew Burton, Director, International Center for Eye Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Dr. Jean Kagabare, Deputy Director for Health Systems Design at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And Dr. Mwiwa Tigbe, Deputy Director for Primary Health Care at PATH. Each panelist will have a few minutes to share insights from their area and topic of expertise. Following their presentations, I'll reflect on key takeaways before kicking off our broader conversation with a series of specific questions before we open the floor for additional questions via the Q&A function. So with that, let's dive in. It's my pleasure to introduce our first panelist for today, Dr. Mwiwa Tigbe, who joins us from PATH, where he serves as the deputy director for their primary health care program. A medical doctor by training, Dr. Tigbe's interest and expertise extends to the development of financially sustainable health systems that deliver improvements in population health outcomes and system value. I'm personally interested in Mwiwa's work in integrated primary care delivery. Today, Mwiwa will address the question, 
why does primary health care matter to global health and the SDGs? Over to you. Thank you so much, Josie, and um, thanks for the warm welcome and warm introduction. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and I just want to start this conversation by saying um, I really want to appreciate um, Site Life for, for putting this together, and thank you so much for this opportunity to discuss the intersection or the relevance of primary health care to achieving the SDGs. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> So typically when we talk about primary health care, and there are a lot of misnomers or misnomers or misconceptions about what primary health care is. People think about it as a gates gate um, a gatekeeping mechanism. Some people think about it as just very, very rudimentary or fundamental or poor health care, right? But it is beyond that. Um, just wanted to address it using the slides. One, primary health care leads to um, strengthening or empowering people and communities to take charge of their health. Secondly, it is um, what we see as a systematic um, approach to, broader, to addressing the broader determinants of health, be the economic, social, or environmental factors that impact health or impact um, a person's ability or a society's ability to actually achieve full um, optimal health. And the third piece is also it serves as an integration platform where we say that it provides people with promotive, protective, preventive, curative, and rehabilitative um, care. So it basically serves, serves as that, um, that, that platform that integrates um, health services for all. Next slide, please. This, this slide basically integrates, um, provides a visual about what every, as in what primary healthcare does. And, we'll, and what we say usually is that primary healthcare covers 80 to 90% of a person's needs, be it from vaccinations to seeing, um, going to see a doctor for, for, um, for a flu or, or having, or having um, a toothache, you also go to your primary care. And you also see that where the arrow is, is right there, we also integrated eye care. Um, not eye, and it's not just there just to, to be self-serving out for, for Josie to feel good about it, but it, it definitely is important because eye care is within the larger, larger sphere of optimal, opt optimal healthcare or within the healthcare needs that people have. So basically we, we, we um, primary health encompasses or tries as much as possible to reflect reflective, reflective and comprehensive and whole healthcare for people and also incorporates prevention and promotion of illnesses and how to manage illnesses and as well as I said earlier also to address the broader social determinants of health. Next slide. We must have heard most times that people, um, or everywhere right now, everybody's talking about universal health care or how do we achieve the SDGs and things like that. But we and we feel that universal that primary health care is the express, we are the vehicle to take us there, right? And this and eye care is also really, really at the center of this because without without your sights, it basically limits it limits a lot of what people can do either to to, to ability to work, ability to go to school, ability to actually have a full life. So it is really important. And we see primary health care as being, as being um, a good platform for that where people can easily access um, equitable, ac um, have equitable access to whatever services they have, in, they, they require, including eye care. So we feel that PHC is the approach and health systems are the means to UHC and also to achieve our goals, our SDG goals. I'm just going to throw this in here, um, a, um, a definition that we have here, or a, 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 yeah, a definition we have here that the demonstrated links of PHC to better outcomes, um, improved equity, increased health security, and better cost efficiency make PHC the cornerstone of health system, um, health system strengthening. Health systems are built on the foundation of PHC and are essential to achieving UHC. Unfortunately, primary health care is really underfunded, is fragmented, and in most cases reactive. One of the things that we have noticed over time is that primary health care, even as it is, and, and even with the potential to, to do so much, um, is still really, really focused on um, the, the curative part of health or part of healthcare. So when children are sick or people are sick, that's when they, they remember, okay, there's a clinic or they're going to a clinic. But we have over the time neglected the promotive or the preventive part of, of healthcare. So we are really hoping that um, 
and that, and that has led to led a lot of people into poverty because once healthcare once health health um, is neglected people end up turning into hospitals where you have a higher <clears throat> where, where um, cost of care is usually higher rather than actually accessing care at, at the primary health care centers where where usually cost is cost of those care services are, are cheaper so um we're hoping that that we'll be able to we'll be able to turn turn that tide around next slide please and just as I said, to close these gaps and advance health, health equity, we must take a holistic approach and reimagine PHC, and we must do things differently. So at PATH, we have basically landed a strategy, which is saying, which basically puts the patient at the center of healthcare. And what are we trying to do? We're trying to envision a world where everyone has access to equitable equitable and high performing healthcare. And how do we try to do this? By accelerating patient-centered primary healthcare through innovation and partnerships. Our strategy um, basically has two objectives. Basically one is tailored centered P tailored PHC to um, which is patient-centered. And we're also trying, to, we're also going to be working with our partners to optimizing um, primary healthcare resources, basically catalyzing new resources to optimize PHC systems and also build, um, given, given the impact of of COVID on what we have seen as primary um, um, on primary healthcare systems, also <clears throat> building resilient health systems. And we're trying, and we're going to be working through three core approaches, what we call, call our three core approaches, which is to drive fit for purpose innovation, brokering transformative partnerships, new and old part, new and new partnerships and, and even bolstering existing partnerships. Then and we cannot un underestimate the the importance of data basically championing evidence-based decision making and we are actually and, and to, to achieve this we have what we call three accelerators that path i'm sorry six accelerators that path um the path leverages which is our country expertise to deliver on this um advocacy and influence basically we have strong advocacy for 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 strong phc systems and more investment in phc then leveraging data and digital tools and also looking through looking at um health um primary healthcare through a healthy market lens and not distorting markets. Then um, our human-centered design approach, basically where we put the patients and healthcare workers at the center of, of what we're trying to do to design um, to design resilient systems and to design innovations. Then we cannot, um, and lastly, we cannot ignore the, the role of gender and equity and um, um, gender and DEI in integration into what we're trying, what, we, what we're doing. So for more information, I'll be happy to take questions and also you can reach out to me um, and Kim Green also um, who, that we have our information out there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Muiwa, for that overview of primary health care and specifically the work that, that PATH is doing to advance this. I think a couple of key themes uh, that really resonated with me were just how we balance the shift from curative to preventative and promotive as well um, in, in really addressing our broader healthcare needs. I'll now um, introduce, uh, reintroduce Dr. Matthew Burton, who joins us from the International Center for Eye Health at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, a world leading center for research and education in public and global health. I'm particularly excited to learn more from Matthew about the global burden of blindness and its impact on SDGs, which is core of what Matthew will be addressing in, uh, in his present today, presentation today. Over to you. Thank you, Josie. Let me just share my screen. Um, and can you confirm that you can see it? Yeah, we can great. see it. Super. Well, thank you very much for this opportunity to participate in this webinar today. Um, as you will all know, this is a really pivotal time for eye health in general. Um, the context is, you know, last year was the culmination of Vision 2020, the global initiative that's framed um, eye care delivery for many countries for the last two decades. Um, in 2019, WHO published the landmark World Report on Vision. And in the following year, 2020, the World Health Assembly passed a resolution on vision. And very excitingly, in July of this year, the UN General Assembly passed its first resolution on vision as well. 
Um, in February of this year, the Lancet Global Health Commission on Global Eye Health was published. And um, one of the key analyses in the commission, and this is the topic that Josie, you've asked me to, to speak to today, um, was a systematic review and analysis of the published literature for studies on the relationship between interventions to improve eye health and the impact that these have on the sustainable development goals. And what I'm going to do very, very briefly is just rush through um, a few slides illustrating some of the links that we, we, we were able to identify in that analysis. So briefly, we found evidence that the provision of eye care services is associated with improvements in workplace and economic productivity, household consumption and income, and employment. And the resulting economic benefits, particularly when delivered in resource limited settings, to really contribute to advancing the SDGs on poverty reduction, SDG 1, food security, SDG 2, and decent work, SDG 8. So for example, a trial showed that the provision of spe free spectacles to tea workers with near vision impairment in India improved workplace productivity by 22%. And in addition, the commission um, performed an analysis um, of the annual uh, productivity loss, global productivity loss associated with vision impairment. Every year, approximately 411 billion US dollars are lost. Educational performance is linked to vision. Children with vision impairments have poorer edu educational outcomes and are more likely to be excluded from schools. We found evidence that uh, providing spectacles to children improves educational outcomes, supporting quality education, SG4, with an effect size that was at least as large as many other healthcare interventions. So improved education is crucial for development, for reduced poverty and hunger, and for enabling work linking back into those earlier SDGs we just looked at. Women carry a greater proportion of vision impairment than men in virtually all world regions. And addressing vision impairment and improving eye health is relevant both to gender equality and reducing inequalities in general. A study from Kenya, Bangladesh and the Philippines found that people with vision impairment from cataract, the commonest cause of blindness in the world, were poorer and reported lower qualities of life than their neighbours. One year after surgery, this gap was gone with no difference in markers of poverty, such as household expenditure. SDG 3 and SDG 11 include targets to reduce road traffic injuries, a leading cause of death in children and young adults. And there are multiple studies that report associations between eye conditions and motor vehicle collisions. Whereas cataract surgery again leads to a reduction in driving difficulties and fewer collisions. Globally, healthcare contributes around 5% of greenhouse gas emissions. A topic with the meeting of COP26 uh, this week uh, is um, very uppermost in many of our minds. And eye care as a high volume service is probably a significant contributor to this. The commission found very limited research on the environmental impact of eye health care delivery. However, practices and the environmental impact can vary substantially, suggesting that opportunities to reduce the impact of eye care, um, which requires uh, a lot more research. Impaired vision and eye health can have broad impact on general health and well-being, SDG3. And in a series of analyses, we mapped out the complex connections between eye health and general health. Impaired eye health has widespread direct impacts, for example, exacerbating depression and dementia, increasing cardiovascular disease risk through reduced physical activity and increased risk of injuries. Encouragingly, there's evidence that indicates that interventions that improve eye health can also benefit general health. Again, for example, cataract surgery can slow the rate of cognitive decline. Vision impairment and eye health are often perceived to have little effect on mortality. And this figure uh, summarizes an analysis of a systematic review and meta-analysis performed by the Commission of Population-Based Longitudinal Cohort Studies, which report the relationship between vision impairment and subsequent all-cause mortality. And here we find a clear, clear evidence of increased mortality risk with increasing severity of vision impairment. 
So our overall conclusion is that improving eye health and reducing vision impairment is an important, if not essential, enabler to achieving the SDGs. This diagram tries to summarize this with the solid green arrows radiating out from eye health, improved eye health, indicating direct effects, and the black arrows, indirect benefits through other routes. We think this is such an important message that we actually put it on the front cover of the commission. Investing in universal eye health is a realistic, cost-effective way of unlocking human potential by improving health and well-being, education, work, and the economy. It is essential to achieving the sustainable development goals. So the Commission seeks to reframe eye health not only as a health matter, but also as an enabling cross-cutting issue within the sustainable development framework. Thank you very much. Thank you, Matthew. It's, um, you know, in, in this, in the work in, in eye health, um, the impact that we see on, on livelihoods, access to education is something that, um, that we notice every day. And yet the broader interconnectedness of the impact of eye health on the entire system um, and how we move forward and move people out of, out of poverty um, is so critical. And so thank you for, for sharing that work um, and uh, for all that you've done to, to lead the conversation in this arena. It's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Jean Kugabari, who is the Deputy Director of Global Primary Health Care, Health Care Systems at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, overseeing a grant portfolio that focuses on research, analysis, and technical assistance to improve primary health care through health systems design and financing. I'm personally really excited to hear more about mechanisms around health financing to advance primary health care globally. Today, Jean will address the question, what are the top three opportunities and challenges in strengthening primary health care systems in low and middle income countries? Over to you, Jean. Yeah, thanks, uh, Josie. Um, I look at the the top three opportunities, particularly in the context of the COVID pandemic. And I think the first one is that the, uh, the COVID pandemic has increased the appetite and urgency to improve the PHC system's performance, uh, which create a new windows of opportunity. If anything, you know, COVID have reminded the world that strong PHC systems is actually the first line of defense against existing or emerging public health uh, threats. At the global level, uh, we have a unique opportunity now to influence uh, the major donors who are rethinking their PHC systems targeting investment strategies. For example, uh, most of the donors are now reflecting on the impact of COVID and also adjusting their health systems programming and application for better supporting particular developing countries. For example, the the Global Fund, the Gavi, the World Bank uh, have commissioned the high level reviews and have established uh, a new health system or PHC strategies. USAID has just refreshed its vision for uh, health system tranquility and that is starting now to roll out the plan. So we have really point of influence with these global partners so that we can actually engage and help to shape the policy guidance the opportunities, target financial and technical support to countries, and also strengthen the response to country needs by facilitating the collaboration with the local partners. The second opportunity I see is the appreciations and appetite for digital health, which has actually increased substantially. You know, COVID pandemic has brought to the, you know, the need for digital health technology into focus. And we see various digital solutions uh, that have been employed during the pandemic. You know, they include, you know, the screening, diagnosis and triage, uh, clinical management, and some actually using the telemedicine to provide virtual, virtual care, monitor and treat patients as well. And we see also a, you know, group of uh, larger donor organizations that have really stepped in to support the development of the infrastructure as a public goods uh, 
for example, Digital Square, which is led by PATH, uh, funded by USAID, the Gate Foundation, and other donors, you know, have really been at the forefront to develop the digital global goods, which includes interoperable platforms, uh, open source architecture that help digitize the health ecosystems and establish the digital alliance to advance the digital inclusion. Uh, and again, here we see uh, ample opportunities to leverage digital health to improve and answer the PhD system. As health innovation continues uh, to experience unprecedented acceleration, many digital health solutions could be leveraged to further drive adoptions and overcome the barriers to better healthcare services beyond this pandemic. And then the third one, opportunity, is also the increase the need and willingness to improve community health that brings health delivery close to, to, the, to the home. And we have ample evidence now that indicate that community-based programs improve equity in access to and use of services. And key lessons from various countries such as Bangladesh, Brazil, Costa Rica, Ethiopia, Rwanda, India, Nepal, and others have shown that community PHC has been a major contributor to the success of these countries in reducing uh, under five and maternal mortality. And really a failure to invest now in community PHC would represent a major loss opportunity for the achievement of uh, most effective PHC in uh, low-income countries. And in summary, developing, expanding, and strengthening the community PHC is one of the most promising approaches available for the short term, as well as a sustainable long-term improvement in population health. Now, when I look at the challenges, uh, I think one of the major challenges that my colleague and we have already alluded to uh, is the chronic underfunding of PHC, particularly in low-income countries. But in addition to poor and, and inequitable coverage, a major function of the health systems should be financial risk protection. And we see in low-income countries, the average per capita PHA expenditure is estimated at around $36 per year. And yet, the WHO estimates that we need an additional $38 per capita per year to be able to achieve the SDGs goal. So there is also an issue of allocation of resources on average, in low-income countries, governments spend less than 40% of their total level expenditure on PHC. The majority of the fund goes to the secondary and tertiary care. And yet, again, PHC can address up to 90% of the population health care needs. So there is really an imbalance and misallocation at the country level. And as a result of that, uh, PHC is actually financed mainly by regressive out-of-pocket payment expenditure, uh, which constitutes around 55% of the total PHA expenditure. And we can see that the global incidence on catastrophic spending will have to remain quite high, around 12%, which much higher occurrence in low-income countries where insurance coverage is very low, patients really face duplicate fees and obviously have inadequate savings. And under COVID, unfortunately, the you know, GDP has collapsed which reduce even the domestic budget, including the donor contribution as well. So PHC spending is unlikely to substantially increase. While the good news uh, per se is that health is now understood to be a major national social and economic security. And therefore, you know, it may receive a higher location relative to other services. But the bottom line is the PHC system have to figure out how to deliver more health for little or less money, focusing primarily on the efficiency of PhD spending. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean. And so interesting to hear um, the, the numbers around existing spend and, and the reality that that really needs to double uh, to, to be able to address needs, um, but also to ensure that the investment is going into the primary care system not just the secondary and tertiary centers. And um, I think that's that's something that across, you know, in, in high income countries too, we tend to have a lot of emphasis, right, on that 
tertiary center care uh, that's very, very expensive um, when there's huge opportunities for preventative promotive at the primary care level. Um, and now is the time to invest, especially given the unique window that COVID has, has given us into what that preventative and promotive care can do in terms of helping individuals um, overcome uh, pandemics and, and other health issues. With that, I'm very excited to introduce um, Dr. Sangeeta Abrol, who is a professor and consultant at Bardem Madhavir Medical College and Safter Jung Hospital, New Delhi, and is the head of glaucoma services. Having worked with Sangeeta for almost four years now, I'm particularly excited to learn more about how she drove integration of eye care into primary care through policy and some of her, her thoughts in terms of how digital health can play an important role in addressing the uh, connection between eye care and primary care. So today, Sangeeta will address the question, what are the top three opportunities and challenges in integration of eye health into primary health care systems? Over to you, Sangeeta. I, I've always been very appreciative of the efforts that Sight Life has put in, um, in the various quadrants of our country. And it's a privilege to be talking here. So I always want to answer this question first. Is India a role model for primary health care? This Illustrative diagram speaks volumes. The genuineness of effort that the little girl has, consider this part as the government, the multiple stakeholders who are all trying to help the system. Is it matching with the needs, with the kind of population that we deal? So understanding the gap is always very important in health systems and more so in the primary health care. Before we get serious, I thought I'll share this. So what is the, what's the common belief in a country like uh, India? So Mary says, my daughter believes in preventive medicine, doctor. Doctor says, oh, that sounds good. So Mary says this is, she tries to prevent me from making her take it. So these are the things we have to deal with and understand before we put the, uh, lay down the lines of healthcare. My highlights would be three, prevention versus cure. What do we spend more on? Second is affordability in a country like India, equitable distribution of health resources still remains a challenge. And then are we actually integrated and available at community level for eye care? So the universal health coverage that we see on the right side is a relatively recent integration by Ayushman Bharat. I hope all of you have heard about it. This says that the promotion and awareness gets, gets as much uh, status as a sustainable healthcare. And all of this is people centric. And early diagnosis get the trust on rather than the management. I can uh, say this, that some of the remote islands, some of the remote terrains also are trying to embed this system. Uh, we uh, would be familiar that India has been the uh, trendsetter in community-based eye care. Some of the models are replicated across the globe, um, though they still do not serve the population uh, to a large scale, but they are uh, community, uh, really community-based to the down ground level. 
we as a country have already supported the adoption of two global targets on eye health for 2030. So to increase the cataract surgery coverage by 30% and the refractive error coverage by 40%. In, the word is increase and none of them looks very easy to practice, but we, we have a big gap and we'll have to work very hard. The major difference now comes between the pre-existing lacunae that we already knew and the pandemic created well that we have now. This data is uh, very illustrative, was very encouraging. This was 2019 and 20. And the number of, even if, you, even if we try to see roughly, the grand total, the number of targets and what is being achieved, at least the number of figures were matching. So the one is for cataract operations, one is for free spectacle distribution, then the collected uh, donated eyes. I can see a twinkle in the eyes of uh, Josie when she sees this because we were doing quite well and we were also visual impairment is a part of our program. So all other causes were inclusive, but the same is no longer too. And it's actually, we are way beyond uh, the expected targets as we can see clearly. And this has uh, taken a maximum brunt by the corneal blindness and also by the spectacle correction. The cataract surgeries will still catch up because that's uh, quite popular in our country and there are multiple stakeholders taking care of it. But the data is realistic and is, I wouldn't say disheartening, but it needs to it needs us to tighten our belts so i have been um, told to talk about opportunities and challenges and i have tried to lay them very clearly if you start the race a little earlier you are bound to win provided you are consistent india was amongst the first countries Yes, we encourage public-private partnership, international and national NGOs have forever been encouraged, integrated, and we owe a lot to them for whatever we have achieved in our uh, visual care. Recently, this is a very good example. We achieved a 100 crore vaccination. The remote areas were covered by the drones, as we can see. So the same thing now, policymakers, we are sitting across and thinking, if this we could achieve, why not try to do the same for the un, uh, uh, unreachable areas for our uh, primary health care? I won't say eye care still, but primary health care. So the other opportunity is uh, this, uh, this was with a lot of, I'm very passionate about this, that we could try and do inclusive education with equal opportunities for people with uh, visual disability. So this is a real uh, achievement of last few years. And forever it has been happening by the community, for the community. I have a very good uh, uh, memory of how sight life could uh, in multiple locations teach our accredited uh, social workers to acquaint uh, them with early diagnosis of diseases. This was more so for corneal uh, diseases. And then the other effort we do is uh, integrating the teachers and parents in the care for refractive errors. This is requirement of the low middle income countries that is that we know so well to make the cascade happen. On the right top corner is a street vendor giving press biopic glasses. And this shows the effort that the community does at every level. I'm not saying this is advocacy, but this is like increasing the awareness to that level. On the left, you see the tea workers that Matthew also uh, mentioned. And this made us realize how much quality assistive 
work you can get by just increasing the press biopic corrections and making the corrected uh, refractive errors better. Now coming to what sight life is very keen about is corneal blindness. So as I said, all international and national NGOs have played a major part in the prevention and early diagnosis. Uh, and the recent legisl le legislation that we achieved about uh, the cornea of an unclaimed uh, road traffic, not having to go through the legal procedures to increase our uptake. India can be very proud of having training of trainers program in the Apex Center. And uh, we have very many examples of institutes making four people uh, visually capacitated by two corneas. There is a recent one in the news as well. So having said that, change is the only dynamic thing I believe in health. So what are the challenges that we face on the ground. Uh, the major challenge is the acceptance. The, uh, I may paint a very good picture, but the truth remains some children don't even go to school. So how does school screening become effective? The emblavia has already set in by the time we intervene. These are things that we have to uh, uh, compensate for and work on. And then uh, the, all of us would know this, that there is a lack of acceptance of cosmetic, uh, of, of glasses for cosmetic reasons. So many blind schools uh, are, 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 are having children registered because they have uncorrective refracted er errors. This is very, very uh, dear to me. And actually we have worked uh, to make this uh, go back in time and make sure that the children with refractive errors don't land up with, especially high myopias, don't land up in blind schools. And the biggest challenge is the vitamin A deficiency that we still see in our country as a cause of corneal blindness. Besides that, whatever we may do, we still lose some eyes to just a mismanagement of a corneal uh, ulcer. There are cultural beliefs and people don't donate easily. And there, uh, there are not eye collection centers everywhere as you may presume. So what is the solution to all this? Having said, you know, I'm not a person who would accept a challenge without a gravitating solution to it. This is a Levisque model. Uh, we have been working uh, for the last few years about not the provider's perspective, but the seeker's perspective, as we can see below. The ability to perceive, seek, reach, and engage. This is so very important in, uh, in an LMIC like India. So have acceptance of what you are providing. This is a chart made by, uh, actually made by us, and we would... Uh, be happy to share this for everybody. So this is a recent model of Ayushman Bharat Health and Wellness Center. How we intend to work? I found some of the things that would be very rele relevant. Asha workers are overburdened, yes. Multipurpose wo workers are going to make house visits. They already are making house visits to ensure that they form the first line of defense. So the preventive part is taken. This I'm saying uh, uh, as I, um, like they would be conducting IEC at the community level. Then comes the referral chain of health and wellness center, which are open and integrated at, as a primary health center with ophthalmology services provided there by the trained multipurpose worker who has a professional six months background. And then is the teleconsultation. This teleconsultation was recently started and it came very useful during the pandemic. We didn't expect this. We were not preparing for this. Yeah. 
So this is my last slide. This is a very futuristic thought. Uh, this part of it has happened and much more is to be achieved. So on the left, as I say this, uh, we are promoting leave behind footprints on the sand of time, leave behind organs. Uh, so this is the way we are encouraging uh, corneal care and then making it equitable and community-based. Ayushman Bharat is very promising. It's integrated the national programs. And I purposely made it IEC to say that like it's, it's a integrated, equitable, community-based. This is the Sitapur model. Again, brings a smile on Josie's face because this has, this is a teleophthalmology model. Very this and sight life has played a major role in this. And I, this is uh, what I want to say. The light at the end of the tunnel has been turned off due to budget cuts, but we are preparing, getting back, and we'll be, we should be doing good with the eye care in primary level. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sangeeta, and um, and just for for all of the the presentations, you know, some of the themes that really resonated uh, with with me is is just the the reality that primary health care is critical to addressing our broader health care needs uh, globally, um, and that integration, while can it can oftentimes feel challenging to integrate eye health into broader primary health care, it's really critical for us to advance preventative and promotive um, avenues of health in addition to treatment. And there's a real need to balance out the preventative and the promotive with the treatment. Um, which has historically gotten a lot of, um, of investment. I think the, in our work um, globally, what we've seen uh, is it really resonates as well. Um, there is of course a need to provide treatment for those who need more invasive care, but so much, and, and Sangeeta touched on one of those, uh, vitamin A deficiency causes um, much of corneal disease in, um, in the younger, population um, in places like India and also um, in Nepal in which we work. And so really advancing those frontline community health workers um, that, um, that Jean talked about to look holistically at their communities and, um, and, and really invest in their communities through um, a holistic approach to primary care is, is critical. And it's one of the ways um, that at, at Sight Life, we really envision the future of integrated eye care delivery at that primary care level is leveraging those community health workers and the primary care providers uh, to look holistically at the patient and put that patient first, um, rather than div dividing the interventions by, um, uh, by disease area. One of the things that we have seen historically, and we've made incredible uh, advances in this um, around the world, is that historically, many strategies to improve health outcomes in low and middle income countries have been focused on a specific disease or specific disease areas. Um, but in primary health care, uh, we really see that differing in approach. Um, as we move into the Q&A period, um, we want to invite those of you who maybe have a question in mind um, to feel free to submit via the Q&A function. I'll kick it off with a few questions for our panelists, um, but we, we invite uh, those of you who haven't already submitted questions to drop them in. One of the, the big barriers that we talked about um, and came up in many presentations was the lack of financing to support primary health care initiatives. I wondered if either Mwiwa or Jean um, could talk a little bit about uh, the reality of, of the fact that currently with health financing um, heavily still focused on, the pa on pandemic resiliency, what do you see as that possibility for funding of primary health care integration moving forward? Yeah, let me start then and uh, happy to pass to my colleague as well. 
Uh, yes, this is an opportunity where we see uh, actually there's a risk if we don't uh, uh, if we don't learn from what we have seen in the past, the verticalizations of disease, COVID can also be verticalized and they can actually receive massive investment, but it will also miss the, the bigger picture we're trying to say here. This is actually the opportune time to integrate and use whatever additional resources we are seeing coming from COVID to have this PHC platform even solidify further. Because we see that any conditions uh, will touch on all the elements that we know of that are critical for any healthcare system. People, you know, we're talking about the community health work who can do a really great job. An you know, example of uh, India is, is, uh, is kind of telling us, we see the supplies, the supply chain, the supply system, how do you get products to the, to the community? We see the data, how do we ensure that we integrate uh, the data system that might be maybe now focused on the pandemic, but to, to, to track and to know exactly where the cases are so that we can actually use it for eye care, for malaria, for other disease. So that's really an opportunity time to pull the resources together. But that also requires the countries to be on the forefront so, so that they have a national plan, which is hopefully costed so that partners can come and then actually use a pool. It can be a virtual pool, by the way. It doesn't need to be physically pulling off resources so that they can actually establish the continuum of care, starting primarily with the preventive activity, which is cost-effective, close to the homes, which is leveraging now the digital uh, health that is emerging, and then obviously be able to push the patient throughout the system, including to the tertiary care if it's needed. But it requires also, I think, a more commitment from the country to uh, increase more resources for health. Because we have seen uh, that several countries are spending less on health. And I think COVID have opened eyes for every you know, policy makers today to see actually health, it's part of the economic. If you see the, what happened about the GDP collapse, it's because of the health. So I think there's an opportunity to make sure that the country put their fair share in health. Uh, and then of course the donors can uh, obviously add to support the comprehensiveness. But there is a long way to go, but I'm hopeful that now we can at least have the bare minimum and create a system where people can actually start prepaying uh, so that when they get sick, they can have the access to care without going into bankruptcy or, or forgo that particular uh, interventions. So I don't know if my colleague uh, Mio has uh, anything to add. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot, Jean. I, I will, I will um, start off from your last point around um, more of national or social health insurance schemes at the, at the, at, at the country level. There, there needs to be more strategic investment in that because I think that provides the veritable platform for a lot of the integration because once countries are able to define a specific package of health services that each individual should have access to or must have access to right then that create that creates an impetus for most providers or providers to tap into that and also there's a prepayment scheme so and that also addresses the issue of equity if government says you cannot you do not earn above a particular amount or up to a particular amount we pay for you but if you earn above this you we, we encourage you or you're required to pay into this scheme that kind of creates a financing mechanism there as itself to, for people to be able to access the different kind of services that they need then someone if someone has 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 a, um and at that point in time at, at those facility at those facility facilities providers are have the physical space or the or the latitude to be able to look at an individual more holistically rather than when it's just um an individual patient coming in or oh, just i'm sorry just um an individual disease secondly um 
look, talking about um, community health workers also, historically, community health workers have not been able to do beyond the remits of their services, right? You have community health worker who is who is paid by the PEPFA program or by an HIV AIDS program, right? He needs to focus on that or a malaria program, he needs to focus on that. And, and that has ex excluded other, 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 and um, the ability to even look beyond that. But, but if we focus on, on, on primary health care, it's, it, or pro, focus, provide community health workers with the tools to say, okay, you have, you're going out to look at an individual, to meet an individual in their home and look at whatever that person needs, right? And you are able to capture all the data, you're able to capture all the information and feed it back. Then the last point I'm going to make also is around the government. Um, piece that, that Jean raised. Even if we have a lot of money, there still needs a lot of ethic, um, um, advocacy to ensure that money goes to the right place. So exit, the data tells us that primary health care can address 80 to 90 percent of the needs. But we see from government budgets, public sector budgets, 50, all part of that goes into tertiary services and things like that. So there needs to be a reprioritization, talking about efficiency, reallocation, and actually putting our money where we can stretch the, the dollar to the largest, to the, to the more extent possible to achieve the best outcomes. Yeah. Thank you so much, and and so so interesting to think about the role that the um, that national insurance schemes play, and and opportunities for people to pay into the system to access care, and then those who who maybe can't afford it um, also can benefit from those services, and just the importance of reprioritization. Shifting gears a little bit to um, to Matthew and Sangeeta, you know, we recently have these these targets that have been included in in eye care on refractive error and cataract surgery. Matthew, from your perspective, what will it take for more comprehensive eye health targets to be assessed and adopted um, at you know, the global level, but also more specifically to Jean and Miwa's point at the country level? <clears throat> well, I mean, the the history of indicators in eye health is is long and complex, and it, it seems that every few years there's a there's a new panel of indicators that have been prepared. But this is fantastic to see both effective cataract social coverage and effective refractive error coverage included at the top table of indicators that WHO is asking countries to to collect. So, I, I think personally, I think it's probably unrealistic and not necessarily necessary to have sort of additional high level um, eye health indicators, specific eye health indicators that are around diseases in, in that sort of top level. But WHO is currently working on a, on a, an up, a refresh panel of, of indicators. Um, in the commission, we, we ran a Delphi process to, to explore that. And if you're interested in looking at the conclusions there, I mean, there are a number of key indicators that you, you, you'd want to know about, certainly things around um, you know, the, the overall prevalence of blindness and the um, the distribution of the health workforce relative to the population, the population in need, and and similarly the facilities where services can be accessed, whether it's the primary, the secondary, or the tertiary level. But I mean, just picking up on the point from moments ago is, is around um, the affordability of eye health services and whether or not they're being included in those pooled uh, financing mechanisms for for healthcare in general. Um, some countries are, but some are not currently. For example covering cataract surgery um, in, in some of those pooled financing mechanisms. So I think indicators around that will be really important as we kind of see eye care seeking to move into the mainstream of universal health coverage, um, well integrated in, in all aspects of healthcare provision, whether it's the policy, the financing, the human resource development, the, you know, the delivery in the primary health facilities and, and so forth. So I'm not sure we need high level indicator we definitely need other indicators and i think um those will perhaps be more specific to to managing the system under the, the eye health care program coordinators at country level not sure if i answered your question directly but that that's what i think yeah. no, i i think that's a it, it's such an important reflection in terms of you know the the visibility of high level indicators and what they offer and how the work the work gets done and you you touched on a couple of key pieces that support that that work and Sankita, i'm going to turn it turn it over to you next 
but that includes, you know, how we provide training and make sure that there are adequate um, human resources to provide these services, how we really do integrate at that primary care level to support work. Um, and Sangeeta, you know, in your work to uh, really make sure that primary eye care was a part of the Ayushman Barrett scheme, um, you, um, you put that front and center. So we'd love to hear more at, you know, from a country level perspective about how that prioritization happened and how you were able to, to include eye care as part of uh, a really incredible program that focuses on access to people who otherwise wouldn't be able to access integrated care. Uh, thank you. I think it's all about advocacy. So when they say that WHA has now has vision, that leaves me more excited. That leaves all of us policymakers more excited because in India, it's a state subject. Health is a state subject. So once it, uh, it gets integrated in the policy from the center to the state, it becomes easier to have the data back falling to us and the targets reset. Uh, it, I would say it like that, that it's the constantness of advocacy that brought us to the integration of the eye care and the all the NGOs, the national NGOs and the international NGOs, the visibility, the work done by them at the primary level, somewhere they made the policymakers realize that how the evidence shows that the quality assistive life years are better uh, for these, these, these diseases. And so it happened for ophthalmology. Otherwise, I'm sure if we didn't have that data coming from um, the state and from the NGOs, it would have been feasible because let me accept not much funding goes to health in India. This is the first thing we have to accept. So if this is the limited funding that we are dealing with and still we get eye there, I think it's because of the, the, the integrated government, multi, pub, we call it PPP model, public private uh, partnership model. That's worked this because the results were visible. Now, what Matthews just said, should we or should we not have a defined target of 30% or 40%? For an LMIC, I can speak for that we do need targets because the country has a very varied uh, uh, terrain, cultural beliefs. And if we do not define and if we do not put it across, I think we are lagging behind. In spite of all our efforts, cataract remains 66% cause of avoidable blindness, even today. So we do need it. And refractive error uh, was not so much highlighted till our last to last survey, where as now we have come to realize that the provision of glasses does not make it a corrected refractive error in India, surprisingly. Am I clear when I say this? So uh, 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 it, even if the government provides the glasses, that does not make the people wear those glasses. Yeah, so it is important, very important for us. And I'm, we are very excited that we got this. We will move ahead and we should be better with our targets. Thank you, Sangeeta. Well, I recognize we are already a few minutes over. I just wanna give each of our panelists a, a brief opportunity to, to share um, in 30 seconds, this will be the challenge, 30 seconds or less, um, how, what, what can we do today to advance primary health care integration into eye care? What is the, the biggest opportunity or biggest lever that we can pull to advance that integration? And we'll go in reverse order of presentation. So Sangeeta, we will start with you um, and John, you're, you're up next. So 30 seconds or less. I'm very clear. It's finance the system and train the people. That shot, you know, empower the people, community, by the community, for the community. 
Sean, over to you. It's to agree on a minimum package of services that have to be primarily based on the community level prevention, then we can go to the next level. But until we get this base right, it's almost difficult to, to imagine otherwise with the little resources people have. Matthew. Um, in addition to those thoughts, um, I think exciting demand from the population in general, um, improving uh, yeah, awareness of eye health needs and um, encouraging uh, people to, to expect to be able to receive services to resource side. So, um, John actually stole my thoughts, but I'll say that. Um, defining one, defining the minimum package that includes eye care, right? But basically from the start, even from primary school level screenings and things like that, or elementary school levels for kids. Then there's also an advocacy piece that Sangeeta touched on that being having you using glasses from or using spectacles from when you uh, from when you're young doesn't make you a nerd so there's that advocacy piece also that population acceptance piece that we also need to work on as well yeah well thank you um i i just want to give a huge huge uh, shout out of gratitude to all of our panelists for joining today um from time zones all over the world and, and making it possible. And for all of you who have um, joined us to be a part of this conversation. Uh, at SiteLife, we, we believe that primary healthcare is a critical component to addressing blindness and visual impairment globally. We cannot do the work of addressing corneal blindness or blindness and visual impairment without that integration. And um, I think that basing that work in advocacy, um, working to establish what that uh, package of eye care delivery looks like at the primary care level, and then comprehensively at the, the people in their communities who they serve is so critical. Um, and that all, of course, has to be supported uh, by financing mechanisms, both in country and globally. Um, so thank you all. Hope to continue these conversations in terms of what, what that integration looks like with each of you. Um, and hope that everyone has a wonderful, wonderful day or evening, depending on where you're at in the world. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you, Lucy.